Thank you, Carla. I didn't recognize myself there. <laughs> this picture, by the way, is for you. It was taken off Newfoundland. So um, we're going to talk about eradication of hepatitis C. And let me at the outset say that I think that that's not going to happen, at least not by the target of 2030. And the, part of the reason for that is that we're continually, as I'll show a little later, we're continually importing hepatitis C into Canada. And uh, that's not going to stop. So we're going to talk about how big is the problem, how many patients are there out there who need to have their hepatitis C treated, how do we find them? And then what strategies do we use to try, at least theoretically, to eliminate hepatitis C? So how many people are there in Canada with hepatitis C? The short answer is after 20-something years, we still don't know. There are any number of estimates. And of course, all estimates depend upon assumptions. And assumptions are sometimes difficult. So the first set of uh, data that came out was from Rob Remus many years ago. The last publication was in 2007. And our concepts of who was infected at that stage are quite different than they were now. And so I'll show you those numbers, but we have to take that with a grain of salt. Then there was the Canada Health Measure Survey, and I should go over that. And then there's some data from the Public Health Agency as well. So this is Rob Remus's estimates from uh, 2007. He estimated the prevalence to be about 242,000, which was at that stage about 0.8% of the population. And you can see the categories that he stratified by, uh, IDUs, XIDUs, transfusion, and other. So uh, at that stage, the thinking was that there was a substantial proportion of people out there who had acquired their disease from injection drug use, had stopped using injection drugs, and, but still carry the disease. Not so sure that that's true today. And this other was this big nebulous group. Where did they come from? We didn't know. He estimated that about 80% of people had already been diagnosed. The Canada Health Measures Survey was a voluntary survey uh, which you filled out uh, online. So first of all, you needed to be computer literate. Second, you needed to be able to speak English or French. And thirdly, you need to be aware that when you give personal information uh, to a computer that is attached to a government, it's not going to do you any harm. Now, when you come from a third world country, that's probably not something that you're very, you, you, you believe in. So the overall prevalence that they estimated there was about 0.5%, but there were a lot of important um, populations, cohorts of people with hepatitis C, that were not addressed by the Canada Health Measure Survey. What was perhaps a bit startling was that they estimated that of the people that they were able to identify who had hepatitis C, and this was on blood testing, only 50% were aware of it. And that is quite scary. And this is data from the Public Health Agency. This is the number of cases of hepatitis C identified each year. And you'll see the, 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 the big peak in the early years as testing became more widespread. But since 2012, more or less, maybe a little bit earlier than that, the number of new cases diagnosed each year has kind of leveled off at about 10,000 a year. And unless we expect that number to drop rapidly in the near future, we still have probably have a fairly large number of patients that we have to account for who have not yet been diagnosed. And one of those populations that we have to deal with is immigrants. So this map, and you've seen this map before, um, showing the, the high prevalence areas uh, of the world. And note that the high prevalence areas are where we get the majority of our, uh, of our uh, immigrants. So China, uh, Russia, Eastern Europe, even the US has a higher prevalence than we do. So even if you come from the US, you're more likely to have hepatitis C. Uh, these very high prevalence areas, Egypt and Libya, Mongolia, uh, and to some extent from the uh, uh, Indonesia and, and the Philippines. So as long as we continue to bring people in from those parts of the world, we will continue to bring in hepatitis C because there are no hepatitis C prevention strategies in most of those parts of the world. Now this may be, a, again, a cohort thing, 
And uh, because most of these people in foreign countries were not infected from injection drug use, they were infected from contaminated needles and contaminated medical procedures, and with progress that will eventually uh, fade away, but still there's this large cohort of patients who uh, are still gonna need attention. And this slide simply shows how many people there are in each of the uh, parts of the world where we get our immigrants from. Uh, so for example, China has you know, nearly 10 million cases of hepatitis C. So our, our big uh, uh, countries where we get immigrants from, China, Pakistan, uh, those are the important ones, Nigeria perhaps less so. But still, uh, when you consider that there are over a million people from China living in Canada, we probably have a fair number of, hep uh, of patients with hepatitis C in that population. And that has not been accounted for in the public health measures, in the uh, Canada Health Measures Survey, because that population, by and large, does not speak English very well and are not sophisticated enough to understand what these health measure surveys are, are looking for and to participate in them. So, I think we can safely conclude that there's a substantial amount of hepatitis C in the immigrant community and that it's largely unaccounted for in many of the national estimates, which would suggest that the prevalence is maybe higher than uh, is generally believed. Now, one of the important things is in identifying who these people are is this birth cohort effect, and I'll try and show some, uh, some data on that. So this again is Rob Remus's data, in which he modeled the prevalence of hepatitis C in different age cohorts. And this was 10 years ago, but still you can see the, the uh, important age cohorts of the so-called baby boomer generation. Right? Those people who were somewhere between, say, 35 to nearly 70 were those who were most likely to have, or rather those were the that was the population in which the prevalence of hepatitis C was most likely the highest. Of, this was modeled now and it depended on some data which may be affected by the rates of testing, so that's a caveat. This is data from uh, the, uh, the uh, PHAC website, and basically what it shows here, and I'm just gonna have to turn around and do this, um, age 15 to 19, no matter when you test them, very low levels of, of hepatitis C. And as you look at the older age cohorts, you can see that in this age cohort, which is the 30 to 39 age cohort, that their prevalence is much higher, or rather the number of notified cases is much higher than in the younger age groups, and then this is the 40 to 59 cohort. Again, much higher uh, number of cases notified. And then the over 60 is this one here, I think it is, or maybe that one, I'm not sure. Point being that once again, this is the baby boomer generation in which the, the highest number of cases by a substantial amount are being identified. So here we have, sorry, uh, let's go back. So here we have the nearly of the uh, nearly 5,000 cases here in 2014. Remember I said the 10,000 overall. So half of them are in the 40 to 59 age group. And here's uh, just putting some uh, numbers as opposed to a graph on that from a study from, uh, from the Public Health Agency again. And you can see the relative contribution of the different birth cohorts to the numbers of hepatitis C patients diagnosed between 1991 and 2010. And you can see that the birth cohort from 1946 to 1965 accounts for two-thirds of the men and just a little more, more than half of the women who've been diagnosed. So clearly, that is a cohort that has a higher prevalence, although we can't say exactly how high, a higher prevalence than, than uh, other age groups. This is a study uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Janju and, and Mel Krajan in BC, again looking at um, different years of testing and different... Uh, Oops, sorry, I keep doing this. Different, um, different birth cohorts, and you can see that it's always the same birth cohort, no matter what year you test them. The same birth, birth cohorts that have the highest percentage of positive results. Once again, confirming the, the higher prevalence in the uh, baby boomer cohort. This is a... Uh, data from the Correctional Institutes, and you can see somewhere in the range of 
27,000 odd individuals uh, in the federal and provincial uh, facilities. And the percentage who are infected with hepatitis C is 17%. Now, of course, this was not counted in Canada Health Measures Survey at all. Again, my point being is that the prevalence is higher, certainly higher than 0.5%, maybe higher than 0.8%. So if we're going to identify all hepatitis C infected individuals, we really should be screening that age cohort that has the highest prevalence. We should be screening all immigrants. Now those are not mutually exclusive uh, categories because many of the Im immigrants will fall into the 1945 to 1975 categories. Uh, in the US, if you remember, their uh, screening age was from 19, uh, cohort was from 1945 to 1965, based on our slightly younger immigrant community here, we think that we should extend that by 10 years or so. All prisoners and all ex-prisoners should be screened. And of course, all other high-risk groups, people who inject drugs, various other lifestyle risks, which we really don't know to what extent those really contribute to the overall pool. But clearly, if somebody's at risk, they should be, they should be screened. Now, here's an interesting one, low socioeconomic circumstances. We know that that's a risk factor for hepatitis C. Does that mean that we have to screen everybody who is in low socioeconomic circumstances? That's a hard question to answer at this stage. So let's assume that we know who all the hepatitis B infected individuals are. So this is a study which actually comes from the um, the interferon era of treatment, and of course everything has changed since then, but it's, I'd like to show it because of the principles that, that come out of it. So in this particular uh, model, they assumed 180,000 active infections that was based on, on Remus's data with a correction for the number of patients who uh, uh, had been previously infected. They assumed 5,000 treated annually, and I'll come back to that in a moment, and that about 2,000 died from natural causes, whether it was from liver or non-related causes. And so obviously over time, assuming no new infections, the overall number of infected individuals will decline. And that whether there's treatment or not, simply because the infected cohort starts to die out. But so what happens to the diseases that hepatitis C causes? Well, if you do nothing, there will be a 90% increase in liver-related deaths. There will be a 45% increase in the total number of people with cirrhosis, many of whom will die, but beyond the 2030, beyond the 2030 time period that is being followed here. Uh, a lot more of decompensated cirrhosis and a, a, a big increase in the number of patients with liver cancer. And we're already seeing that increase in the number of cases with liver cancer. Um, 15 years ago, at our center, the majority of cases with liver cancer were hepatitis B, and he hepatitis C accounted for 25%. Now, uh, hepatitis C accounts for nearly 50% of all our cases of liver cancer. So, uh, so that was uh, projections of what might happen if you didn't treat anybody. So obviously that's not going to happen because we're going to offer treatment to some patients. So here's a study from Rob, Re from Rob Myers uh, who looked at a number of different management strategies. So the base case was that there was no increase in the SVR rates, again from the interferon protease inhibitor era, and no increase in uptake of treatment. Then they looked at whether there was just an increase in SVR or an improved SVR plus treating patients at different stages of disease. And then what happens if you changed the uh, level of disease for which you were prepared to treat over time? So this is the effect of treating patients who have stage 2 fibrosis or higher. That's the restriction. And what you can see is that in the base case, that's the base case is uh, SVR only, no, no sorry, uh, the same SVR as was uh, available at the time that this was done there was a decrease in the total number of viremic cases, much the same as I showed you on the earlier slide. But if you started treating individuals, then you would get down to a very much lower and eventually negligible number of total viremic cases. But it depended on what you did. So for example, uh, if you uh, look, treated F3 only, this is what would happen. If you treated F2 only, 
That's what would happen. If you had this uh, progressive strategy where you initially treated everybody with F2, with F2 or higher and then you moved down to F1 and then down to F0, you would achieve elimination by 2030, more or less. Uh, and so that was one possible strategy that could be applied. And then if you did that, what happened to the various liver diseases that hepatitis C causes? And here the results are really qu quite dramatic. So if you decided to treat F3, you get an immediate decrease in the number of patients with decompensated cirrhosis, and a somewhat delayed but still pretty rapid decrease in the number of patients with liver cancer, and a decrease in the number of liver-related liver deaths. So the effect of treatment on the diseases that cause patients to die is quite dramatic and quite soon. Okay, I can take a hint. I, you don't need to cut my head off. <laughs> And then if you increase the number of treated patients, um, you get down to uh, no viremia and a much lower rate of liver deaths much sooner. So obviously, the more patients you treat, the better at the overall outcome. So how many patients are we treating? Well, this is the pattern of treatment going back to 2014. And then once the DAAs were, uh, were in, uh, introduced in 2016, this is a, a rough figure. We treated somewhere in the range of 14,000 people that year. So a, a, a substantial increase in the number of treated patients. But can we do better? Well, I think we probably could. I mean, there are other countries that have done much better than we have. So, for example, in Egypt, this is all government regulated, established 54 treatment centers, treated 800,000 patients over a 10-year period. The cost of drugs there, of course, is somewhere in the range of $300, $300 a course as opposed to what we pay. But there was a very strict control of prescribing habits. You couldn't go and visit Egypt as a Canadian and get your drug there. In fact, one of my patients tried to do that and failed. In Australia, the uptake of treatment improved from about 2,000 to 3,000 annually to 22,000 in the first year after licensing of DAAs. So why have we not reached 22,000? I'm not sure. Here's a study from William Wong, who's somewhere in the audience here. Uh, it's a cost-efficacy analysis of patients, the, the, the cohort is patients with uh, genotype 1 infection who were treated with DAAs or genotype 2 or 3 had sophosphavir ribavirin and peg riba for genotype 4, 5, and 6. Of course, today that no longer applies. But again, what this shows is that if you screen the baby boomers and you treat them, you do prevent a significant number of liver-related deaths uh, from liver cancer and other co and uh, cirrhosis and liver failure, uh, if you target the cohort as opposed to the birth cohort as opposed to no screening. So under reasonable treatment assumptions, cure of all infected individuals is achievable within two de decades, but it does mean that we have to find those individuals. The progressive strategy of first treating patients with more severe disease is the most efficient in eliminating uh, infections and complicated cases, but obviously everybody will have to be treated eventually. And in fact, that's the strategy that appears to be in play at the moment, where mo the, most of the provinces started out with F2, now they've loosened the, cr the criteria and uh, patients with F0 and F1 under certain circumstances can be treated, and my understanding is that next year the floodgates will be open for everybody to be treated. According to Rob Meyer's analysis, about 11,000 patients need to be treated annually. Uh, and when that happens, all scenarios re result in a similar benefit. But it does require that we have optimized case finding in these high-risk groups uh, to achieve these goals. The object of the exercise, obviously, is to prevent the complications of hepatitis C. It's all very well treating hepatitis C, but you also need to treat the complicate. You want to prevent the complications. And so, Eradicating hepatitis C is the beginning, not the end. Hepatitis C management provides us with an opportunity to deal with other common liver diseases, particularly non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which probably affects 25% of the people in this audience, and alcoholic liver disease, which I hope afflicts nobody in this audience. But those are common diseases which interact with hepatitis C, and even though you may cure the hepatitis C, if these diseases persist or are present and persist, the patient will still have a bad outcome. 
I want to make a comment about, um, uh, well, thank you for your attention, but before I go, I want to make one comment about the focus of work on hepatitis C in Canada. From the beginning, at various levels, the focus has been on hepatitis C as an infectious disease to try and limit and deal with the infected pop the, the populations who transmit disease. But hepatitis C is also a chronic disease with bad outcomes. And that has not been addressed at a public health level. Even at this meeting here, most of the presentations have to do with the populations that are actively transmitting uh, disease and not to do with the populations that most need treatment. That is the birth cohort, the older people, those with cirrhosis, and those who are likely to get cirrhosis if they have not been identified. And I would like to suggest that at the next meeting, I think I made this suggestion a couple of years ago and there was no uptake, but I'll make the suggestion again, that the focus needs to be on this very large infected population who are at high risk and who we are not identifying and whom I don't believe that we will be able to identify in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Morris. Uh, we have time for two questions. Sam. Nicely done, Morris. Uh, <laughs> Make it short, Sam. I, I will. Just <laughs> every week I see a bunch of uh, immigrants, most of the world, and there's a pervasive myth amongst them that they can't get into Canada if they're HIV, Hep C, or Hep B positive. They turn up with negative tests in their home countries. And then they said, oh, I must have picked up whatever Hep B in the last two years because I was negative from the test in China. And I'm, now I'm, the, the cynical part of me says at least a third of all the tests done in home countries are, are false negatives, either accident or deliberately. Yeah. Hi, I just actually add more of a comment. My name is Zoe from the Toronto Community Hep C Program. And I've been actively working and supporting people who use drugs with hep C for over 10 years. I just have more of a comment to you, Morris. Um, one, I found it offensive to say that people from China are not sophisticated enough to understand hep C treatment. And, um, and that actually are the problems that we have, which I think that also you would agree with, is that we don't have the resources to make culturally appropriate services uh, for newcomers and immigrants in Canada. And, and that actually, you know, I look forward to the hepatitis C response being firmly planted in communities so that community can do effective uh, testing, treatment, support for people living with hep C. Um, so I found, sorry, I found that kind of offensive. Um, I would also say that the decades of excluding people who use drugs, uh, the, the stigma that people faced, that those folks are continuously dying and there's still people who do, do need support. So while we are uh, while we're talking about this, I think that's really important to acknowledge that we let those people die and we really, uh, it's not even just about you know, looking at people who are transmitting hep C, but also the fact that we let a lot of those folks down and I've spent years supporting them in their in their deaths, actually, in their palliative role. So, um, and I would also just say that low socio socioeconomic is not a lifestyle, but actually a symptom of the system that we live in. And I found that also quite offensive. Also, the multiple tattoos, and um, and I just can't let it go. I'm sitting here angry, and I am looking forward to the so, day so thank you, that Zoe. we're not holding thank this, but we have really it. Really important Thanks. points. Can I respond? Please. Okay. To imply that everybody from China was unsophisticated, but the generation of the elder genera older generation of immigrants who have not come not only from China but from many other places do not have the tools to be able to answer something like uh, the Canada Health Measure Survey. With regard to injection drug users, uh, I don't mean to denigrate them at all. Clearly, they are dying. They're not mostly dying of hepatitis C, though. And my concern, as I'm standing here with the task of talking about eradication of hepatitis C, is to deal with those people who are going to be most likely to die from their hepatitis C. Thank you. Good. Thanks. So I think we'd all agree that uh, we'll all serve people in Canada better if we remember that there's many different people who are living with hep C, and one isn't more important than the other. 
So thank you very much, Morris, for that articulate talk.